Cuddle, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Citizen Aid, where we wrap the week's current affairs with the best political team on television from a very, very, very Auckland perspective. Warning, we're as fair and balanced as Fox News. Joining me tonight are my revolving panel of bloggers and Auckland opinion shapers. She's a lecturer at the Department of Film, Television and Media Studies at the University of Auckland. One of the greatest female bloggers in New Zealand today when she bothers to blog. Digital feminist and torture film aficionado Phoebe Fletcher. And when he isn't hunting with political corporate mercenaries Simon Lusk hatching plans to overthrow the democratic process by online smear disinformation campaigns to spike the MNP referendum, he's innocently hacking into the Labour Party's databases for the integrity and protection of democracy. He's a God-fearing family man who is a pillar of his gated community. Hard right-wing storm blogger Cameron, dirty dead done eye-wateringly expensive, minus any subtlety, Slater. Welcome to you both. Coming up tonight, issue one, another tragedy at King's and the focus has conveniently gone on youth drinking. When will New Zealand grow up over its alcoholism? Issue 2. John Key greenlights casino masquerading as a conference centre in what amounts to a hate crime against Auckland architectural heritage. Issue 3 tonight. Should right-wing black ops thug Cameron Slater be allowed to breach Labour Party supporters' privacy? And will this election see the rise in online dirty tricks from the Slater sewer? And we'll end the show on a final <laughs> word. But let's kick things off with issue one. The latest youth death at King's has sparked renewed debate about young people and alcohol, with the student in question having participated in a pre-ball drink with the elite families of Auckland. The debate has conveniently been focused on youth and alcohol rather than a wider reflection of us as an alcoholic nation. Phoebe, the research shows us that the majority of heavy drinkers are all over the age of 25. Aren't we all in denial about the social impact of booze if the focus is perpetually blaming teenagers for their drinking behaviour? Oh, I think that's a very good question. Um, I certainly tried to kind of trawl through the Law Commission's report into alcohol. It was a very lengthy document. Um, and there certainly is evidence that teenagers do binge drink. But as you say, I think it is um, representative of a wider drinking culture um, that we have in New Zealand. And I think also Australia has a similar problem. If you look at European countries where people are socialised to to drink uh, more responsibly, they don't have the same sort of issues. So yes, I think we do need to take a kind of broader look at our nation and our drinking. Why are women drinking more now? Why are women drinking more now? Um, are they? Yeah. Well, the, the, the statistics show that they're drinking more alcohol. Oh, I've got plenty of statistics. I can show you lots of statistics. <laughs> is it? Is no, it the re well? The, you, you don't think so? You don't think women are drinking more now? Oh, uh, oh. Well, there there has been this discussion over the Ladettes, for example, yeah. in Australia and so on. I, I mean, I think you know, pre previously women were kind of slightly excluded from those sorts of things, and you know, since. Uh, we've had a, a second feminist revolution, it's of course, time. in the 1960s. Well, no, it's just that we're taking on the same sort of rights that men had traditionally, and women might have been excluded from some of those um, activities. So I think True that's something to be is being expected. able to be as drunk as men in public, isn't it? It's twice as many drunks. On that's the right. Isn't, isn't the reason, Cam, isn't the reason the government are gutless over alcohol reform? Is because they've invested so much political capital in building up the nanny state mythology that they now can't enact effective social policy for fear of stirring their favourite bogeyman in the minds of the shy folk. I don't even know what you just said. Okay. It's just rambling socialist dogma. Yeah, but, yeah. But the, the, the simple fact here is they that have a whole the, lot the of government have whipped out, haven't they? Well, ha hang on a second. A whole lot of people have jumped into this issue and said, oh, we've got another tragic death at, at King's um, that's alcohol related. Well, that's actually not true. In this instance, there's no alcohol involved in this. And you said in your intro that we had the elites of Auckland that's right. um, at a pre-ball party and yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for a start, these are, these are King's kids. They're not the elites of Auckland. They're just the ones <laughs> with money. Right? It doesn't mean they're elite. None of them were from grammar, were they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of um, myths and misconceptions around this particular incident that uh, in the fullness of time will come out, will, which will show anyone who's jumped on the bandwagon with regard to alcohol is going to look very silly. But I think in New Zealand we've got a general pro problem with our legal drugs that we have um, available that are out there, and alcohol being the biggest one, uh, where we've got these um, uh, available places to buy the legal drug all over the place. That, to me, is still not 
the issue. The issue that we've got here is that New Zealanders, by and large, are incredibly immature when it comes to, to um, personal responsibility but for the pouring government, the, the stuff down their guts. The government have wimped out, though, with their recommendations. All governments have they? wimped out for years over the issue. Yep. You know, we have um, a crackdown on methamphetamine, we have a crackdown on weed, we have a crackdown on all these other things, but do we have a crackdown on alcohol? No, the war on drugs is certainly finished on the, mm. uh, on the alcohol front, isn't it? Phoebe, we know lobbyists were fervently lobbying the government in the last two weeks leading up to the week reforms, and the Greens claim that the latest delay is the booze industry again pushing changes until after the election. How much of this resistance to do something meaningful, like get booze out of supermarkets, no advertising and lower blood alcohol levels now, are being caused by corporate interests trumping public health? I think, uh, yeah, that one I find hard. I, I go back to, again, if you go to a lot of places overseas, you can buy booze from the supermarket as well. Wow. So, you know, I, I do think it is an, an issue, like you say, of us having a social problem. You know, in, in fact, it's something that we're known internationally for having a social problem with our booze. Mm. So um, I think it's it's not, you know, to quote the ads, it's not the drinking, it's the way we're drinking. Yes. And, um, you know, I think the arguments, I mean, certainly we might have a reduction in kind of police arrests and so on if you look through that Law Commission report if we raise the age again to 20. But I don't think that's going to teach people to drink responsibly. No. And I think the problem is with adults as well. Mm. Do, you think, do you think, you think the liberalisation, though, the uh, ability to be able to get alcohol 24 hours on tap anywhere, you don't think that's part of the problem? I don't think you can get alcohol 24 hours on tap everywhere. You know, I, well, I think, there are plenty I think, of I mean, part awesome. of the Law so Commission's what? recommendations were that they raise the cost of alcohol and that clearly there is a problem with RTDs being less expensive than water and dairies, yeah. for example. Um, but no, I think it's, it's more of a, a, a social problem in terms of the way that people actually drink exactly. rather than... It's uh, nothing to do with cost Cam, or price it, or licensing well, or anything like that. As, 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 a, as, a, as, as a rabid free marketeer, supply and demand arouses you deeply, uh, but even course. you must accept that with a product as socially corrosive as booze, the state has to step in and take a role. How about a minimum price on RTDs? No. Would you be happy? You wouldn't? How's the minimum price on wages going for you? Well, obviously, hopefully, one day one of the political Youth parties will pick that up. Youth unemployment's never been higher. So, right? so, you, so you don't think there should be a minimum way, is it minimum price no, on on there on RTDs? There shouldn't be any artificial ceilings or, or floors or anything. Let on the market the decide. Let the market decide. If the market's decided that they want to have RTDs cheaper than water. Well, that so be it. In fact, it's ridiculous anyway that water's um, at the price it is. So you should actually look at regulating the price of water if you want to regulate anything. Then they're charging more than booze. <sighs> okay, both of. <laughs> See your answer there. Uh, Dr. Gluckman's report highlighted the need for effective social policy for young people, yet this government seemed to define effective social policy as sterilising the poor. Will Gluckman's work cut through the redneck knee jerks, yes or no? No. Um, I think the problem really, as you know, kind of Cam said, is the high youth unemployment. Like, if we're giving people something to do at that age rather than to just sit, to, sit around and drink, I mean, that to me is really where the issue is that we have, what is it, the seventh highest unemployment for youth in the OECD. Oh yeah, it's pretty, So we pretty should falling. be very concerned so about those statistics. Abol abolish minimum wages? Uh, gosh, is that, is, is that your little meme for this week, is it? Uh, Dr Gluckman's report, you think it's going to be ignored? Oh, well, I'd ignore anything from Gluckman. I mean, he believes, he believes in global warming for a start. Oh, for the love of you! What, what, I, find, what I find hugely ironic yes, about this is the it. Greens are the ones who, who are bleating on the most about this, yet, yet on another drug. They want complete liberalisation. Oh, of bah, bah, bah. Uh, both of you, Mana Party are floating a 20% vice super tax <laughs> on top of profits made by the tobacco, gambling and alcohol industries to be reinvested directly into the communities most impacted by their products. Isn't it time for the profits of these vice industries to be used to offset their wider social damage? Yes or no? They already do through taxes. I, Not yeah. enough. I mean, if you look at cigarettes, there already is a large <laughs> amount of taxes that does go back. It's and more than and half. The it's more than and, half. and yet they walk out with such it's large more than profits. Half. Shouldn't yeah. their profit margins be taxed as well? <laughs> Well, they just make I, losses, then, I go back Palmer. to what I said before, though. I think the problem is not necessarily um, these drugs or legal drugs, if you talk about alcohol being available. It is, is things like unemployment and the social conditions that create the abuse of these drugs. Mm. Yeah. Who wins, who loses by continuing to blame the kids for New Zealand's booze problems? Well, it's not the kids' fault. It, it, you know, it's society's issue, but society's this uh, amorphous beast that no one can ever sort of pin down. New Zealanders do have a drinking problem. They, you know, 
for someone like me who doesn't drink, mm. it's hugely uh, hilarious to watch the antics when you go to a party and see a whole pe bunch of people mulleted trying to um, trying to have lift one another. <laughs> <laughs> it's always and lifting each uh, other. For, I don't for me, I just don't get I just don't get it why, uh. why they need to to drink to that. I mean, I enjoy a, a glass of wine or or um, you know the occasional gin or, or whatever, but. Getting yourself absolutely trolleyed so you, you, you're waking up in a pool of your own sick doesn't really not a no, turn on. appeal. Not much of a turn on, is it? Yeah, maybe they need to have ads like that. You know, oh, look at the cool guy waking up in a pool of his own sick. Phoebe, your thoughts? I kind of agree with Cam on that one. I mean, I think it's a way that New Zealanders drink. I mean, I, I remember when I've been younger, I've seen people vomit. Okay, been you know outside vomiting and then straight back in drinking again and then do that repeatedly. Just to wash the bad I mean, taste I think out. That, you know, <laughs> like that, there's oh. an, an, an issue with excess, and I, I I do agree that in moderation. I mean, it's a whole prohibition debate. Well, that works real again. well. There's it? nothing no. like the glorious hand of heavy government regulation to sort something out. Issue two: John Key green lights casino masquerading as a conference centre and what amounts to a hate crime against Auckland architectural heritage. Phoebe, why should the government change law just because Sky City want to pretend their new casino expansion is a conference centre? Uh, it's a very worrying precedent, I think, and it's one that you know the National Party have obviously already done with <laughs> Peter Jackson. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, I had some serious questions about the statistics that John Key was throwing around there. He said only 0.04% of New Zealanders were problem gamblers. Mm. I've been looking into this. Um, I found from the Ministry of Health 2002-2003 report into problem gam gambling that the research into that indicates it's around 1.2% of the population, so, so stuff and all it again. tends to be the people. Well, no. That's a huge difference in, in Losers, statistics. You mean. And you know, what they find is that um, with a greater availability of gambling, you tend to get more people gambling. Oh, I, I think that. gambling is a little bit different than alcohol, no, um, as far as I'm concerned. But I think also, too, that um, you know, there's kind of myths in the way that this is being constructed, in that the people that are most affected, or the communities that are most affected by problem gambling, tend to be Pacific Islanders and Māori. So, again, where you know, if you look at the, 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 the places that you. have the greatest incidences of problem gambling, yep. They are, you know, in rural communities where people are really poor. And so I think this is, you know, hugely problematic that, um, you know, in this kind of economic environment, you know, we're getting the, giving the green light. To more casinos, yeah. I know. Cam, this is a real, unnecessary and bewildering slap in the face of your dark Sith mentor, Judith Collins, isn't it? Why is your good, 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 good friend John Key whipping her? In public like this, in 2001, when your dark Sith mentor, Crusher Collins, was on the Casino Control Authority, she green-lighted Sky City's earlier application for expansion alongside the checks and balances demanded for the negative social impact of gambling. Yet in his lust to push through this next expansion, John Key has swept aside all the checks and balances Judith carefully constructed when on the Casino Control Authority. Is this public slapdown punishment for Judith looking like a possible contender for the National Party leadership? I think that you're missing the point entirely here. Help that me. This, Help that me. this deal was not put together by John Key. It was not put together um, by Judith Collins or to get Judith Collins. This deal was pushed through by Len Brown secretly and furtively in association with a former Sky City staffer who now works on his staff um, and they've done a deal that on the surface they can they can lord up as it's not going to cost ratepayers any money but it's the it's the next step that when this conference centre is built where do you think all of Auckland City's uh, council funded uh, activities are going to be taking place so, well there, there's a quid pro quo for a, for a corporate putting money into providing a convention centre and that's, that is that that council and that city will have to conduct all of their operations from, the, from that convention centre. Mm. And that's the real issue, not that there's going to be some changes to gambling laws or anything like that. Uh, the, the real question th that you need to be looking at, the real issue you need to be looking at is that your pal, Len Brown, the left wing's great, great saviour of great Auckland, hope. Great has hope. done a dirty deal in secret um, behind the scenes with a, with a major corporate. Phoebe, doesn't this decision mean the counter-proposal of the Edge becoming the conference centre and the St James being renovated as an art centre mean the St James is going to be left to rot, doesn't it? 
probably does. Good. Yeah. Knock it down. I mean, I, that, that's the thing is that it's going to affect the Aotea Centre. Yep. Um, and, you know, you've really got to wonder if Sky City were the only people that were asked to provide a budget in this um, contestable round, whether it was probably. actually contestable. Mm. Well, mm. I bet it wasn't. Well, well, no Len Brown's but, form, it wouldn't have been. Well, back to you, Cam, on that. Isn't Len Brown slashing his own revenue source at the Aotea Centre? Because 50% of their business our conferences. Well, what would Len Brown know about revenue? The guy ran a small little office in, in South Auckland uh, where he was a third-rate conveyancing lawyer, and now he's the mayor of the largest city in, in New Zealand. He has no idea what he's doing commercially. He's done a scurrilous little deal in the back rooms. Um, but with, this will with, hurt his own revenue oh, yeah. source for, through the ATC. But he doesn't know that now. Right now, he just, re he just realises that in order to get a convention centre and a theatre for Brian Rudman, he had to do a deal with corporate Auckland because there's no other way there was any money going to be available for it. Question to both of you, as many overseas professional associations ban holding conferences at casinos on ethical grounds, will we end up with Let's mainly domestic groups booking the new venue? And as such, doesn't the international justifications of casino expansion not harming the locals argument fall over dead? I mean, aren't we going to be opening this this, this, this conference centre in a casino when internationally they're moving away from that associations for ethical grounds. Won't we in fact just have domestic people coming for conferences here? But whose ethics are we talking um, about? I think we might have some internationals as well. But what I would say to Sky City is why don't they sort out, you know, <laughs> the casino first of all. I mean, how many reports over how many years have we had about the staff being you know, bitten by fleas and wearing flea collars. Flea collars, that's, right. Right. that's yeah. what happens when you've got Unite Union backing you. Oh. <laughs> well, it's their little story. It's not, you know, they uh, do it every year. Uh, is, 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 isn't the, the justification it's just going to be aimed at overseas uh, markets fall over if, if we're going to have a drop off? Look, I don't really care. Uh, it, the rate payers aren't going to be building a convention centre, so that suits me just fine. So actually you're happy with jo uh, Len Brown's uh, I, I don't, duty? I just don't duty. care. Yeah, you don't care. Uh, who wins, who loses by pretending this, this casino is a conference centre? I think uh, certainly some of the poorer communities in Auckland lose. You know, I think that um, we need to be very clear about who casinos are aimed at. And 40% of their you know, profits do come off those poking machines. Mm. And one in five users of those is a problem gambler. Yeah. So to say that you know, this is not going to have social effects is, is just really it's you just know, true, lying. Yeah, yeah. It's lying. Uh, who wins, who loses by pretending this casino is a conference centre? Um, well, Brian Rudman gets a theatre, so he, he wins. He'll be very happy. Brian will be happy. Brian will be happy. Um, the ratepayers won't have to fork out for this because Len's already ear-tagged their rates for um, paying some money mm -hmm. to the people who control the Tanifa. Thank, thank goodness. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, Sky City wins because, um, well, they get to control a whole lot more losers. Thank you, panel. Coming up, should right-wing black ops thug Cameron Slater be allowed to breach the Labour Party supporters' privacy and will this election see the rise in online dirty tricks into the Slater sewer? Citizen A is back after the break. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Citizen A. We're reviewing the week with the blogger Phoebe Fletcher and that awful, awful Cameron Slater. Issue 3 tonight. So a trooper on the National Party Research Unit Death Star finds a weakness in the Rebel Labour Party Alliance website and informs mercenary Boba Fett Slater here to go attack. Cam. As a convicted cyber criminal, aren't you breaking <laughs> some kind of three strikes law with your breaching privacy online once again? What do you have to say for yourself this week? Well, for a start, I haven't breached anybody's privacy. The Labour Party are the ones who have done that. Secondly, I have to um, refute your allegation that the National Party was involved in giving me any information. Right. I categorically uh, yeah. refute that. Mm. Um, mm. Not only that... Uh, I know. But they I, went there first. They did test it out. Well, 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 no. That's what Labor says. But they've only produced a selection of IP addresses. That's they correct. Ha they haven't produced um, eight months' worth of logs from the server, which I can easily produce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, okay. So, so, so if they want to go down that yep, track and they yep. want to keep telling lies, yep, I'm yep. happy to keep telling the truth. So so somebody within... Because the National Party have admitted that somebody found it. So they say. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, yes, they do. Well, I'm not they a spokesperson for the National Party. Okay, but that's what I'm the National Party I'm not even a member say, of the National but Party. But they deny that they pass it on to you. Absolutely, Which, and I agree so, with them. So, so who, 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 did you just come across it on your own? Absolutely, I came so across you were just, it on. You were just... You were wandering through the Labour Party server no, no, and you no, no, came across thing, it. Here's the thing, Bomber. Yeah. This was open to the yeah, world. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? We all get that. Not only was yeah. the Labour the, um, National Party person been in there, not uh -huh. only was I in there, uh -huh. but there would be literally thousands of people who were able to be in there. Chinese People's Party, probably. Oh, probably. Okay. So, um, so, you know, so you just Nigerian wandered... Nigerian scammers. You just wandered on Russian there. hackers. You just wanted on there, found it. Yes. Now, are you going to publish all the details? Because you've obviously found a couple of juicy bones. Oh, there's a reasonable all amount of information, and I'm still analysing all the data. <laughs> You're analysing it, yeah. Um, the thing is, is the issue is not about who, whose names I've found or mm -hmm. what those people are. Because you're a defender of democracy. That, that people yeah. are entitled to, d to donate to a political party. They're yeah. entitled to have their privacy respected, yep. Yep. which so far I've done. That's right, you have. It's the Labour Party that has breached their privacy <laughs> by making this available to, <laughs> to the you. world. I see. No, 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 so, not just to me. But to, to the, the world. Google, the world. Google yep. indexed yep. this entire site and has mm -hmm. been doing it for six months. Okay. So, so you're just a defender of freedom and transparency and goodness and love. Here's the thing, Bomber. Yep. If you found the National Party server exposed, what would you be doing? It would be a whole different story. Exactly. And I, I would there be hosting my own show on TVNZ. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cameron's defence, Phoebe, is effectively, if I may paraphrase, if I leave my house unlocked and Slater walks in and has a look around and takes some personal messages of mine, that's a, he's blameless. Bullshit. Because it's my fault for not locking my door. Isn't that bullshit? Uh, no, I don't think it is. And I don't think you can compare it to leaving a house unlocked. I think you can compare it to leaving naked photos of yourself online and hoping that people don't stumble across them. In fact, when I first heard about this, I thought, hmm, you know, Slater, what have you been doing? <laughs> okay, and then when I looked into it, as someone with a basic modicum of web knowledge, that was left exposed. The Labour Party are very clearly they at fault here. Down. The way that they have a attacked this, I have to say, they need to take some responsibility. I don't know whether they had a poor web contractor. You do not leave an open directory of people's credit card details on a website ever. You would not expect that from a company. Well, I do not database. expect that from the Labour Party. That is not to say that um, stuff ups don't happen. Okay, Stuff ups do happen across organisations, but take responsibility for it. Apologise. And you know, the thing is that that might, it was so open. Uh, there was no hacking involved. It was literally just going to the website and they had left an open directory. And quite frankly, I would be horrified if my credit card details were on there, which they weren't. Okay, that, um, you know, that, that anybody could have, you know, th they are lucky in one sense that it's actually Cameron Slater that's found it, rather than somebody that is ripping money out of people's credit cards. You okay. know, because they would have had 18,000 details there. It's just... It's shocking. What should Cam do with the information now? Um, well, of course he shouldn't release people's credit card details. And I yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I think, you know, th this is to be expected, okay? I was watching something on the, the release of the Pentagon Papers yeah, um, yeah, the yeah. other night, you know, and they were talking about, um, on Voice of America, about, you know, the transition that has gone on in politics. We are now in a WikiLeaks environment. Um, you expect leaks either way. This was not a result of hacking. I think this is something slightly different. But that um, I think the Labour Party need to employ better web contractors and perhaps double check. I mean, if you're going to be taking Someone credit card details it. off people, that's serious, you know. Um, so, what, so what are you going to do with the uh, all these details you've got? Whatever Come I on. like. Whatever you like. So so will be a, a slow drip up to the election. I, I'm a firm believer in a tactic of death by a thousand cuts. <laughs> you certainly are. You shouldn't release that, morally, ethically. I won't be releasing any, any person's private details, but there's plenty more there. That's oh, not a person's sure. people's private details. Hmm. I mean, the Labour Party left their membership database and all the associated details and the backups for it of six months' worth of backups available to the world for anyone to just click. I mean, it is kind of the equivalent of leaving a box of papers on a bus, to and be it, honest. It, it really is. And interestingly, the, the licensing information on the server was yes. Creative Commons. <laughs> uh, will this election be the election of dirty online smear tactics, Phoebe? Of 
course. I mean, as I said before, in the WikiLeaks <laughs> era, this is what you expect. I mean, as a politician, you'd be a fool to be operating in this kind of environment yep. and not expect it. Yep. Okay, it's not to say that ethically, although, you know, as I say, that was open to anybody, you know, I, if, if I were one of the people with the credit card details, I'd be quite glad that it's been found by somebody that's not going to use your credit yep. card, yep. for example. Did, um, the, did the National Party tip uh, Slater off? I think, no, of course, it's not. probably a political attack, uh -huh. you know. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I yeah. think, on on the other hand, as I say, it's like leaving a box of papers open or posting photos of yourself naked online on some dating website and hoping that no one comes across but it. So, so, so Boba, Fett, Boba Fett, what are we going to be expecting from <laughs> okay, you in the future? Here's the thing. Right? Yep. The Labour Tell said me. National tipped off Slater. Mm. Well, well, that's not true, and mm. I know that's not true. Happy mm. to sit and take lie detector tests on that. Yeah. The issue mm. is not that National went in there and looked. It's that they were able to go and look. Mm. Now, Labour needs to stop crying like sooks. Yep. Because you are a defender. You're a defender of democracy. They need to stop crying like sooks. Yep. They need to fess up to the New Zealand public about what they did. Yes. And they need to sort it out and someone needs to resign. That's true. Someone does need to be fired for it. Uh, who wins, who loses by publishing Labour Party donor contacts and details? Well, I think, of course, it damages Labour's credibility mm. slightly. And I think mm. that, you know, as Cameron said, they need to change tack on this and actually just deal with it so that they can go back to the issues that they would like to be fighting this election on. Yes. Um, you know, I, think I don't know what they want to be fighting the election on. Right oh, now they want to be fighting a right-wing like blogger. To be. And that's, that seems to be their tactic. And so bike who, rice who wins, I always win. You win. So, no. so, so, so the winner, yes, so you. The winner is the winner. I know that you always win. But it, 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 as long as I'm in the news, I'm winning. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Like Madonna. It is. <laughs> exactly. he's, a, he's a little bit like Madonna. That's right. Uh, let's wrap the show with last word, Phoebe. Your last word this week is? Uh, my last word would have to be watching Campbell Live last night and the Earthquake Commission refusing to appear on camera at all for the people of Christchurch. Unbelievable. Uh, you know, those people are under immense stress at mm. the moment with the amount of aftershocks. There are people that are just absolutely in limbo. Woman's Refuge has been getting phone calls every yep. 15 minutes. It is an absolute disgusting shame that the Earthquake Commission refused to appear on camera. Amen. It is absolutely their responsibility and their prerogative in this kind of crisis to be able to offer some people some assurance. Yep. And it is deeply worrying that they will not Good point. even do Good that. Point. Amen, amen. Uh, Cam, your final word this week is? My final word is that I, I published a list of um, demands. Uh, <laughs> yes! In, in response to Chris Flatt's uh, weak, rather weak letter that he, he sent me. Yes! And, and I'm going to be pushing ahead with a, with a demand that Fred Dagg lead the Labour Party. He couldn't do any worse uh -huh. than, uh, than the current Muppet they've got there. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Phoebe. Ladies and gentlemen, to my final word. As the election sparks up and the pressure of the economy turns to political anger, Let's take a moment to recognise how lucky we are with the New Zealand political system John Stewart so gorgeously flirted with this week. While there is anger between the left and Greens, Māori and Mana, ACT and National, Labour and Phil Goff, and while this election will be fever pitch once the full ramifications, the enormity of change, the National Government are quietly planning to push through, wake the sleepy hobbits up, we should acknowledge the privilege we all share by living in a peaceful country where the levers of power are determined by debate and not violence. We should strive to live up to the highest standards of civic public debate because, damn it, we don't have any excuses to allow it to descend into naked muckraking. Take the standards nasty and personal attack this week on Slater. I agree with Julie Ferry from Hand Mirror that personal attacks on Cam are odious because... That's not the way we should fight this election. Slater's ridiculous right-wing ideas can be pushed over by a puff of liberal reasoning. Attacking him personally is boring because there's so much to attack. It's like clearing gorse, endless and futile. <laughs> this election will be the noisiest and angriest, but we should not forget the day after the election, we all have to share the same home. If you like tonight's show, please join our Citizen A Facebook site and connect with other like-minded news citizens and follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter and Facebook page. Thanks for watching Whanau. Good night, Aotearoa. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.